Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our worship service. We're so happy and delighted that all of you could be here today. It's good to be back from uh, our vacation in Indiana. Things went real well and got to see family and, and some friends, so uh, we appreciated that. However, on the, on the return, um, I got sick, and how many days was it? Seven, eight days. Oh, okay. And, but uh, I just had a really bad cold. And so <clears throat> bear with me. My vo- I, I feel fine now, but my voice is still trying to return. So anyway, good to be back. Good to see all of you. Uh, today we are uh, looking at our epistle lesson, okay, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And we, we have his introductory words to the believers there at Ephesus. And they immediately take us into the wondrous depths of God's eternal will and way. And this is an amazing thing that we learn, is that God tells us that he chose us in Christ even before he created the world. That's just mind-boggling, isn't it? Well, we're going to explore that a little further in today's sermon. Under the theme, from eternity to eternity, let us praise the Lord. Again, we're using our abbreviated uh, version of Rite 2 for our order of service on page 60. And we'll begin with our opening hymn, Hymn 219, but we'll be singing it to a, a slightly different tune. So let us return then to page 60 in your hymnary, and we'll begin with the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. We 
continue then at the bottom of page 61. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Therefore we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, most merciful God, you have given your only begotten Son to die for us. Have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only begotten Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To all who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this unto us, O Lord. to God on high. God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy and to bring forth fruits of faith and hope and love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We now focus our attention on the scripture lessons that are printed on the back of your bulletin. And our Old Testament lesson today comes to us from the book of Amos, chapter 7, beginning with verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words. For this is what Amos is saying. 
Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy any more at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people, Israel. This is the word of our Lord. Our epistle lesson for today is taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. And I want you to listen carefully, because this will serve as the text for our sermon today. So this is what Paul writes. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us, made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put in effect and to, and to put, I'm sorry, the sun is shining on my words here and uh, throwing me off. Let me begin that paragraph again. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. This is the word of our Lord. <laughs> and our gospel lesson today comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, beginning with verse 7. And I invite you to rise for the gospel reading. So Mark records for us that, calling the twelve to him, meaning Christ, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. This is the gospel of our risen Lord. Let us now confess our Christian faith together as expressed in the words of the Nicene Creed. You'll find that on page 69, the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, 
being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we join together now in singing our sermon hymn, hymn 222. Peace to all of you and grace from God our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So as I mentioned this morning we're going to focus on Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 1 <clears throat> and specifically we're going to focus on those verses 3 to 14 that I read just a moment ago. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, your grace is so glorious and effective for our salvation. And we stand in awe that you have chosen us, that we have been fully redeemed by your precious blood. And we are forever grateful that our hearts bear your name and the salvation that your name brings. Bless us this morning through your word and sacrament and empower us to share that amazing love of God with others. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, dear fellow believers, 
we would all agree, and I believe this would be from everyone's personal experience, that the scope of what we are able to see is directly proportionate to our vantage point. What I mean is, for example, standing on top of the Smoky Mountains enables you to see far more than what you can see when you're driving through the Smoky Mountains. When my wife and I lived near Seattle, we often saw beautiful scenery and mountains when we would drive back and forth uh, from the church there. But when we were at the top of the Space Needle, well, then the, the view became even more spectacular. What a person can see is indeed determined by their vantage point. Now, this is important to understand as we look at today's epistle lesson, because today's text could be somewhat confusing. In fact, down through the ages, many churches have misunderstood and misused what the scriptures are teaching here, especially concerning election or predestination. <clears throat> now why? The reason for that confusion or that misuse is because they try to understand this teaching from man's perspective, from a perspective that fits into their logical minds, limited though those minds are. So in order that I do not make that same mistake, and so that you don't lose the tremendous gospel comfort contained in these words of our text, our goal this morning is to look at the doctrine of predestination from God's perspective. And so with that in mind, let our study of this text for today be under that theme that I mentioned a few moments ago, from eternity to eternity. Let us praise the Lord. Now, as the one and only true God, the Lord our God lives in what we would perhaps call the eternal present. And we say that because the Lord, for the Lord, there is no past and there is no future. He sees all things all the time. We, on the other hand, cannot even begin to conceive what that is like. And so I'd like for you to close your eyes and imagine. And you do realize what a risk I'm taking by having you close your eyes during the sermon. But I want you to imagine. So maybe we better not close our eyes on this one. I want you to imagine yourself standing on a majestic mountaintop this morning. Now, using the words of Scripture, let's come to see that no matter whether we turn and look into eternity past or we turn and look into eternity future, we have every reason to praise the Lord. Okay, so as we are on top of that mountain and we turn into eternity past, we focus our attention on verses 4 through 6, where Paul said this. He said, For he, now this is Christ, chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So what Paul is telling us here is that before you were born, before your parents were born, before anyone in those pictures you've seen in your family album was born, even before the universe itself was born, God chose you. Now, let those words just sink in for a moment. God chose you. God predestined you. God adopted you. 
to be his own dearly loved child. Why? Why in the world did the eternal God, the almighty creator of heaven and earth and of all that exists, do that for the likes, or for the likes, yes, of you and me? Especially when we think about our sinful warts, all of them, and our sinful baggage attached to our souls. Why? Well, that leads to another question. Why are some saved and others are not? That's one of the questions that the Christian church has debated vigorously for centuries. And as a result, some branches of Christianity teach that God, in his divine wisdom and power, elected some to go to heaven, and he elected some other people to go to hell. We often refer to this as double predestination. And it actually sounds kind of logical, doesn't it? If he elected some to go to heaven, well then by default, he's electing others to go to hell. But can that be true? Would God predestine someone to spend eternity suffering in the fires of hell? Well, not according to Scripture. Think of John 3.16, for example. For God so loved the world, hey, that's everybody, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever, again, that's everybody, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Think of John chapter 2, verse 2. He meaning Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's everybody. And think of 1 Timothy 2, where he says, this is good and pleases our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. See, here's the key. When you look at what the Holy Scriptures say, when we are willing to take God's holy and inspired word at face value, then we can clearly see that our Lord God would never predestine someone to spend eternity in hell. Now there are other branches of Christianity that have taught that God elected people to be saved in view of their faith. Now by that, what they mean is that God knew that this person or that person would one day accept Jesus into their hearts and come to faith as their Savior. So then on that basis, in view of that choice, they say that God elected the person to be saved. And I can remember distinctly a very uh, dear man in my own past, a, a teacher in high school, uh, who actually was telling me about this and he said every person is a movie and God knows that movie from the beginning to the end and as he sees your movie played out if somewhere along the line you end up accepting Jesus asking him to come into your heart well then he writes down your name and puts it in the book of life and again that sounds kind of logical but can that be true? Not according to Scripture. According to Scripture, we are all conceived and born in sin. Psalm 51, verse 5. According to Scripture, we are all born spiritually blind. 1 Corinthians 2.14 Spiritually dead. Ephesians 2.1 And spiritually enemies of God. Romans 8.7 meaning that our sinful natures wants nothing to do with God. And according to the scriptures, no one can choose to come to faith in Jesus on their own. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, or Titus 3, verses 3 to 7. Now, it's true that God knows our life. 
from beginning to end because He knows all. But we do not contribute to our own salvation in any way. Spiritually, we are as dead as a doornail. And a dead person can't ask for anything or contribute anything, let alone asking for life itself. Well, then what then is the basis of your election? Why did the Lord predestine you to spend eternity with him? Well, look at what Paul tells us in our text. He says, he chose us in him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. See, what Paul is telling us right here is that your election is based solely and purely on the amazing grace. The amazing, remember what grace means, undeserved love of the Lord your God. Think about that just for one moment here. Stop and think about what that means for your daily life. From all eternity, God has loved you. From all eternity, God has loved you with a love that's just beyond measure. From all eternity, God has loved you with a love that you do not deserve. You don't, I don't, nobody does. And if ever, if ever you begin to think that somehow you do deserve God's love, if you ever begin to think that perhaps you did do something to contribute to your own salvation, then take a moment to stand in front of the mirror of God's holy and perfect law. And there you will see a brutally honest image of yourself covered in the filth of sinful thoughts and sinful words and sinful actions. You and I both, not just a few, but covered and we quickly realize we don't deserve anything from God except his wrath and his punishment for all of those sins. All of that filth. No, dear ones, as we stand on the mountaintop this morning and we turn to look at eternity past, the undeserved love of God, which led the Lord to elect us, to choose us, to be holy and blameless in his sight. The undeserved love, which led the Lord to adopt us, to be his very own. That's what, on a daily basis, leads us to say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He chose me even though I don't deserve it. Now, let's take a quick look into eternity future. Here, I want to focus your attention on the second half of verse 13 and verse 14. And it reads thus. When you believe, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of of his glory. Now, through the power of the gospel, working in word, the Bible, and the sacraments, God freely gave you the gift of his Holy Spirit. Understand, that's a gift. If you earn that or deserve that in any way, then it wouldn't be a gift, it'd be a wage. But we contribute nothing. So it is the gift that God has given us. And that gift is the Holy Spirit when he created the gift of saving faith in your heart. This gift of the Holy Spirit is described here in our text as the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Now we all know what a deposit is, right? If you put a deposit down on a house that is, that, that house then is now yours. 
It can't be sold or given to someone else. Now, yes, you may have to wait a little while before you actually move into that house, but that house is yours. Your deposit guarantees it. On the other hand, if someone gives you a deposit on your house, well, then you know that there's more to come, much more. Well, in much the same way, the gift of the Holy Spirit is God's deposit to you, you personally. The gift of the Holy Spirit is God's guarantee of your inheritance. And what exactly does your inheritance include? Well, we we'll go back to Paul here. Uh, look again at the opening verse of our text. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. See, as a saved child of God, your inheritance is nothing less than the glory and the perfection, the joy and the happiness of living in your heavenly Father's house in his heavenly kingdom for all eternity. It's just joy on top of joy, on top of joy, on top of joy that never ends. Yes, it may be a while yet before you actually move in, but in his grace, God has already given you his Holy Spirit as that deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. So, as we stand on our mountaintop this morning and turn to look into eternity future, well, then how can we not say at the top of our lungs, praise the Lord for the future that he has in store? So, quickly, what have we learned so far? Well, one, we learned that when we stand on the mountaintop and we look to eternity past, we turn to see God's love for us is so great that even before the creation of the world, he elected us to eternal salvation. And we can't help ourselves but to praise the Lord for that. We've also learned that when we stand on that mountaintop and we turn to look at eternity future, there we see the glorious inheritance that our gracious Lord has waiting for us in heaven above and again we can't help we can't stop but to praise the Lord for that eternal future he has in store but before we close today we also need to take a, a moment to stop and realize where we are standing as we look past and future what is this mountaintop from which we're able to see from eternity to eternity? For that, we look at the opening words of verse 7. In him, again Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The majestic mountaintop on which you and I are standing this morning is the majestic mountaintop on which you and I were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The majestic mountaintop where Jesus secured the complete forgiveness of all our sins is none other than the mountain called Calvary. If we want to understand the scriptural teaching of election properly, if we want to understand the scriptural teaching of predestination clearly, then we have to view it from the perspective of the cross. Because it's from there that we see that no matter how difficult our life here on this earth might be, no matter how mercilessly the wind and the waves of this world might batter and beat against us, when we're hanging on to the cross of Jesus Christ, or actually better said, when we realize that it is the nail-pierced hands of our Savior Jesus hanging on to us, then no matter whether we are troubled by what ha has happened in the past, 
or concern what may happen in the future or are simply trying to make it through today. The amazing love of God proclaimed to us by the cross of His Son enables us and motivates us to praise the Lord. And my prayer this morning for you, dear ones in Christ, is that you will indeed take home with you the tremendous gospel comfort that is found in the scriptural teaching of election and predestination. Let the cross of Jesus Christ be, the, be such a focal point in your life that no matter what direction you're looking, from eternity to eternity, you will always know that you have every reason to praise the Lord and to truly mean it. And may our gracious God enable all of us and empower all of us to reflect that confidence and that truth in our daily living. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. And now may the peace of God which transcends all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds firmly planted in the risen Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Again, just a reminder <clears throat> uh, to uh, make your presence known through our worship participation cards that you have there in the pews. If you're visiting with us this morning and you'd like to know more about uh, our ministry here at Gloria Day, uh, well, give us your name, your phone number, email whatever way that we can contact you, and we'll be happy uh, to do just that. Uh, also, if you have a prayer request, uh, please use the card for that, and Linda will see that I get it uh, this week, and I'll include it in my own prayers. So let us now pray. O God of grace, our loving and compassionate God, who had your own son die for every sinner, your promise is that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But being by nature dead in trespasses and sins, we had no power to choose Christ as our Savior or to come to him in faith. But gracious God, what we could not do, you have done for us. Even before you created the world, you knew us and chose us to be your own through faith in Christ. And in due time, you sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts to convert us and bring us to faith, guaranteeing our inheritance of heavenly glories and everlasting life. We do confess and freely admit that there is no good or pleasing thing in us to make us worthy of your choice or worthy to be brought to faith or worthy of eternal life. From first to last, you deserve all the credit for our conversion and our salvation. We confess that we daily sin and fall short of your glory. Nevertheless, we are comforted knowing that no one can bring any charge against us, we whom you have chosen. Nor can anyone condemn us because it is Christ Jesus who died and was raised to life and who now intercedes for us at your right hand. Forgive us then of all our sins for Jesus' sake. And from the bottom of our hearts, we are eternally thankful that you have chosen us and brought us to faith, that you have justified and saved us through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now we ask that you would sanctify us continually through the Holy Spirit so that we may put away sin and abound in good works. Help us demonstrate our election and calling by living a God-pleasing life from day to day, nourished in our faith and love by a vigorous study of your saving word. And use us, Lord, to gather others of your elect into the kingdom of heaven by making us able and eager witnesses of Christ. We pray that you would move our hearts or that you would move hearts everywhere to call on Jesus' name for salvation. And we are confident, dear Lord, that you will take care of us 
your chosen ones from eternity, providing us in body and spirit with everything necessary for our physical and spiritual well-being. We want to also especially lift up to you your servant, Kathy Schultz, who will be undergoing knee replacement surgery this week. We ask uh, your blessing on the surgeons as well as the others who will be tending to her care and that you would enable them to carry out their skills effectively so that the surgery can be a success and that Kathy can find relief from her pain. Bless the physical therapy that will follow and enable her to be restored in the very near future and that she will be able to walk again properly and without pain. Lord, we also thank you for the rain that you provided the farmers uh, south of us and ask that in your mercy you would provide the same blessings for the farmers here and north of us as well. We ask this, dear Lord, with the understanding that we want your will to be done. And we pray, Lord, that you would take full charge of our earthly lives, guiding us and protecting us and defending us and helping us prosper in our individual callings. We belong to you because we were purchased by the precious blood of Jesus. Take full possession of our wills and let them always delight in serving you. And for all of your manifold blessings, we thank you, precious Lord, and we do so in the name of our Savior Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us now turn to page 76 in your hymnal as we continue with the service of Holy Communion. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Come now to receive the Lord's Supper. And now may his body and his blood strengthen and preserve you in the one true saving faith unto life everlasting. 
Amen. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. And now with believing hearts receive our Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant to you His peace. Well, again, it's wonderful having all of you worshiping with us here today. And we thank you for coming. And it's always our prayer that you have been strengthened in your faith through God's word and sacrament and have found encouragement and comfort in the fellowship of fellow believers. Uh, thank you, Nancy, for providing the music for our worship service today. We always appreciate that and you. Uh, by way of announcements in the bulletin, uh, I draw your attention to a couple of them quickly. Uh, of course, everyone is invited to the uh, fellowship hall right after our service today for the uh, ladies group and their pie and ice cream social. And uh, if there are some leftovers there, I guess uh, those will be up for sale so you can take some home as well. School board, uh, those of you who are on it, will be meeting this Thursday at uh, 5 p.m. And then there is a work day plan for uh, that Friday, the next day. So look at your calendars and see uh, if and when uh, you can help. And you don't have to be on the board. Uh, you certainly can come and help with various uh, fix-ups and clean, cleaning things, things like that, uh, as there is no daycare uh, going on that day. Also, uh, well, I'll wait, because Roger, you want to make an announcement, right? So I'll bring that up in just a minute. But I uh, want to also make mention that uh, the ladies group, they're still collecting um, toothbrushes, toothpaste, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, dental floss, along with children's sunglasses. Um, I'm not sure what those two have to do together, but they're collecting them. So I think the sun shines in, in Ukraine too, so that's where they need that as well. But anyway, there's a box in the back, so if you can help out, uh, eventually all of that stuff is going to be boxed up and uh, be sent to uh, Ukraine. And then just a reminder, as it says there, uh, if you are Thrivent members, you can designate your uh, Thrivent Choice dollars to our school, our church, or both. You can divide that up. But again, that's just money that's there that could help us out. So if you are a member, please uh, contact or, or contact them. And if you have some trouble with that or don't know exactly what to do, you can also contact Linda Miller, who has all the answers. Yeah, any question you have, she's got the answer. No, I'm just kidding. Roger, you wanted to say something there briefly. Yeah, I just to bring up Pride. This year there's some pretty tough restrictions put on us from the county health department. Do we have to wear gloves when we serve food? And so we can't be taking the gloves off all the time to take lunch, right? So we need a lot of help this year. We need food servers that are wearing gloves. Yeah, we'll be there. Uh, I won't be able to yell, pull pork sandwich, because 
we're not we're not uh, selling pulled pork this year, um, and mainly because of just all the added restrictions. It just makes it so difficult. Uh, and I've been on vacation, so I don't know if we're doing pizza. Have you heard anything? Okay. So we're selling hot dogs and uh, corn on the cob and uh, sodas. Water and some sodas. Root beer. Or we can, we can do anything we want because... You know, because they try to stay away from booths selling the same things. But since we're the only booth, um, that it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. I have a blast doing it. Yeah, it's, it's fun. And your shift, it just goes by so quickly. Uh, so if you can spare us uh, that time uh, for those dates that are uh, listed there. Um, did you list the dates, Linda? Well, it's Friday and Saturday. Uh, Next weekend, not this coming weekend, but the weekend after that. Um, you know, come down and join us. And if you can't be there for a shift, come down and get a hot dog. We'll have plenty. Okay? I don't know how people didn't die by the millions in times past, but yeah, but yeah. So I guess it was because people were just dying in the streets uh, from the corn getting a little cooler or something. But anyway, uh, that's government, and and we got to do it. But you know, on another side of that is that the you know the Lord may have provided us an opportunity where our church can, can shine. Because yes, we make some money uh, doing it, but really our purpose is to expose ourselves to the community and, and have opportunity to dialogue uh, with people, which we've, we've done all the time. And tell them about the Lord. <clears throat> I mean, when I'm there, I'll, I'll help with that. You go ahead and do most of it, but I'll, I'll help with that. But anyway, it's, it's a great opportunity. And it, it's also, um, you know, good for us to be known and seen uh, in the community. And uh, we did discover a secret, though. I'll tell you, don't tell anybody else. The secret that we discovered was the last time we had it, COVID canceled last year. But we decided uh, the year before that to serve hot dogs, which we hadn't done before. Now, the American Legion also serves hot dogs, okay? But the American Legion sells hot dogs that have the harder skin on it. Guess what kids don't like? So we were having bunches of families coming over to our booth, even though they were selling hot dogs too. And we had some uh, parents that said, oh, I'm so glad you're selling these cheapo hot dogs <laughs> because our kids won't eat those hard skin hot dogs. But don't tell them, okay? That's our secret. All right, any other announcements that need to be made? Yeah, and thank you. Oh, the one announcement also that I wanted to mention was, um, you know, we're still in July. August is going to be here before we know it. And we start planning, you know, for the year. Kind of gets um, in full gear at that time. And we really are hoping to reorganize our Sunday school. And we have the potential of a couple classes, maybe even three. Uh, if we want to do some some other things too, but we really need uh, help in teaching them We can supply all the materials that you need and and so my appeal is if you can help us Then you know, let us know let me know or let the church office know and as I said before You don't have to necessarily be tied into that for the whole year Maybe you'll take uh, a week Maybe you'll take a month. Maybe you'll work in, in tandem with someone else. But we really need uh, your help, and so we want you to pray about it. Pray about it yourself if you can help, or if not, keep us in prayer, because it's, you know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know about what a cruel world it is out there, and it's just growing more and more ungodly. So our young people need that foundation 
of God's Word. So pray about it. If God moves you, wonderful. But also pray about it that God would move others, if you can't do it, uh, to fill that position so that we can be giving um, our young people uh, a foundation of God's Word. Because they're assaulted every single day. Not only out there, but the TV and the other media comes into our homes and assaults their faith as well. So keep that in prayer. Alrighty? Uh, well, may God bless your daily walk with Him, and I'll usher you out, okay?